Brothers and sisters, raise your hands with me. Raise them up. Praise God. We are here tonight to talk about things religious. Sinners and saints. Heaven and hell. And God. I said God. I bet you never expected that, did you? <laughs> well, this old place had a number of religious connections, believe it or not, including our own confessional. It was in the hallway. It was a sidebar in the hallway, and it provided the kind of privacy that confessionals uh, offer. And uh, we got the odd confession there. I mean, everybody wants to confess something to his bartender now and again. Well, good evening. Welcome to Dinner Theater here at the Old Empire Hotel in downtown Gilbertsville. Population 348. That's been a busy night. My family owned this hotel for about 25 years. My parents bought it in 1961, and I was 19 years old. I was about a year and a half away from uh, emigrating to New Zealand. It was a handsome, handsome building, beautifully maintained, and uh, thriving business when they bought it. Over the next 10 years, they pretty well ran it into the ground and uh, was virtually bankrupt. Worse than that. My father took money from my mother, took money from the business, borrowed against it, gambled it all the way on horses, and, uh, and he killed himself. And he left my mother uh, sort of stumbling into Alzheimer's, my younger brother still in high school, uh, and he left a, a veritable mountain of debt and bills. And um, I called it an avalanche, really. <laughs> and, uh, the avalanche of 29, because by then, this was 10 years, uh, I was 29, and it was left to me to try to figure out how to pay down those bills. It's, uh, it was a very difficult time. My wife and I were visiting, or we were here for a visit uh, from New Zealand with our young children, and, uh, well, it was more than a visit. Uh, once we arrived and saw, uh, right after the suicide, and saw the bankruptcy and my mother's condition and my brother's situation, uh, we were trapped. We had to stay and to try to rescue the business and indeed the family from further humiliation. I was uh, talking about things religious. Well, the empire had a lot of religious connections, uh, not the least of which was, uh, remember the old joke, uh, it's all right to date a nun, as long as you don't get into the habit. <laughs> yeah. The night before my father killed himself, the night before he may have got into the habit of uh, my aunt, Sister Lawrence Joseph, in the choir loft, uh, one of the apartments upstairs. Uh, another religious connection. Customer, Joe Politano. He was a regular. Joe uh, moved up the sticks here from, from Brooklyn. <laughs> Before we get to him, let's go 3,000 miles to California. Remember Jack Benny? TV show. One of his favorite laugh lines, he used it many times, involved a location in California. He would be at a train station. Now leaving a track. 31, the train for Palo Alto, North Palo Alto, Huntington, Huntington Beach, and Cucamonga. Remember that? <laughs> then the next week he'd be at the racetrack. And they're off in the lead, his movie star, nipping on his heels, his rabbit dog. On the rear, at the stretch, his girdle girl, Choo Choo is on the rail, followed by Cucamonga. And Benny would say, for crying out loud. <laughs> Back to Joe Paltano. <laughs> hey, Morgan. Morgan. Want to bid on my wine business? Hmm? I buy about four cases a month. Well, Joe, uh, there's no bidding on wine in New York State. The state sets the prices for every, every bottle of wine. You can't charge more, you can't charge less. 
Yeah, don't give me that crap. <laughs> don't shoot the messenger, Joe. That's the state law. And it's not worth it anyway. There's so little markup in wine. Yeah, yeah, the old crap bowl. Jeez. Hey, you know who makes this wine? The monks. That would be the, uh, the monks of Kuka Manka. <laughs> Don't be sacrilegious. Jeez. You know what happens, you sacrilegious? You go to hell with all the umpires and the lawyers. That's, you know what they make you do in hell? My third grade nun, she told me this. They make you for whole eternity. And then some. You got to learn to try to straighten bananas. Stuff like that. Drive you nuts. <laughs> yeah, they would do it. I would do it, Joe. A couple of eons of trying to straighten bananas. <laughs> you know what else these monks do? They bless this wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like holy water. I mean, the priest, they drink it in a mass. Yeah, I think he, you know, the Pope, he probably chugs this stuff once in a while. You know, over in the 15th chapel, 16th chapel. Well, they got a lot of chapels over there. You know, the, the one where that, uh, that paper hanger, Michael D'Angelo, laid on his back there, he patched up the ceiling, you know? Yes, uh, 16th chapel, the Pope. <laughs> you know, the Pope says his mass is in Latin. So would that be Cucus Monkus? No, they reverse things. Probably be Monkus Cucus. There you go again. Jeez, more of this sacrilegious stuff. You know your trouble? You don't got no faith. You're as bad as my ex fiance She don't got no faith. Your ex fiance I, I never knew. Yeah, well, I went out with that woman for 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. Same, same woman. Yeah. Well, we was engaged for 10. Oh, 10 years. 10 years. Same, what happened? She done me the dirty. She give me the boot. She, all I did was ask her. I asked her to wait one more year. That's all, one more year. She won't. Jeez, what kind of woman is that, eh? It's a good thing I didn't marry her. She got no faith. No faith. Like you, you know. And here you are trying to rip me off on a case of my favorite wine. She's I ought to report you to the, to the church, you know, in St. Mary's over there in Oneonta. Or maybe Morris. Morris. They got a church in Morris. They got a priest up there. Yeah. They tell me he's a bit of a poof there, but, uh, you know, he's uh, supposed to have a better collection of high heels and garter belts and, and, you know, petticoats than half the women in the congregation. But... Uh, <laughs> But you know, that ain't saying much. I mean, Morris, New York, it ain't your holy cuisine of high fashion, you know, like uh, Paris and, and Brooklyn. Herb had faith. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. Herb <laughs> had faith. Faith that there was no God. Herb was a regular at the Empire. You might remember him from an earlier series of Tales of the Empire. The Empire. Oh, a pit of prattling peasants. <laughs> Apart from dropping his pipe, um, <laughs> Herb drank vodka, neat. Uh, and sometimes he drank Coca-Cola for three, four weeks. I don't know what that was all about, but whatever he was drinking, he was very happy to heap scorn upon his fellow denizens of the tap room. Faith. God. Heaven and hell. Religious crap. Christianity. Mumbo jumbo. <laughs> then there was Philomena. Philomena was a beautiful, single, shapely young woman. And Philomena drank um, hormone. <laughs> Pharaoh. I mean, she oozed sex. 
Well, that being the case and hanging around a saloon, you can imagine that she met the odd sinner and she offered them the odd religious experience. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I just have to hear a, a confession. I tell you, Margie, girl, I was so mean. I, I was in the parking lot the other night. <laughs> Took me by the hand, but God, she led me out to the back 40. You know, your back lawn back there with the grass a little bit tall. Golly, you wanted to try something new, she said. Something called green grass. <laughs> Tell you, that woman, she said, that's better heaven, that was. That was better heaven. Uh, five Hail Marys, good act of contrition, drink a half a bottle of gin, use the other half to get the grass stains off your knees, go in peace. <laughs> Some of you may remember from another series, Tales of the Empire, uh, a regular named er 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 Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, he had a religious experience. He was playing pitch across from the bar and he was dealt the perfect hand, one hand in 10 million. Ace, king, queen, jack, 10, and deuce of the same suit. Oh. So he bid $100 that he would take every trick, which is a piece of cake, with a hand like that. There were just a couple of small things that Eric was not aware of. To thank you, dear God. To thank you. We 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 read them and we weep. Ace, man, man, man from heaven. King, king. Thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you. Queen. Lord, 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 Lord. Jack. Praise God. Ten. Lordy, 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 lordy. <laughs> the two things he didn't know were that his buddies had rigged the deck to give him those six cards, and they had rigged the deck to give another guy another six in the same suit, including a three, which, of course, would take Eric's... D -d -d deuce! <laughs> God, 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 damn. <laughs> Eric got really drunk that night. Well, you see, Tom, it's like this. You know, I was in the other night, and I bought a drink for Felmina, and oh, one thing led to the other. Now, don't tell nobody. One thing led to the other. And she's 2 o'clock in the morning. We're down out in your back lawn there, and she wants to try something she never tried before. It's called green grass. And uh, you know, five Hail Marys, good act of contrition. <laughs> Go in peace. <laughs> Eric, Eric, good morning. Good morning, Eric. You don't look too good. I'm not, not, not. Mm -hmm. oh. I bad, bad enough. Lose a hundred bucks. Best, best car this side of heaven. This morning, lose, lose my car. Some, some massive stole my car. You're not kidding. No, no. Go, go, go. Poof. My good green. Be be gone gone just 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 like that. You call the uh, police. I'm afraid, afraid to. Insurance is out of date. So shows my license. That matter. I mean, I only drive drive it between my house and the Empire, and half, half the time I walk. What, what am I going to do? I mean, my my good 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 good. Your green beetle. 
Right, right. There's that name, poof, 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 poof. Poof, gone, just like that. Right, how, how, how do you know? Hmm? Yeah. Let me guess, Eric, let me guess. <laughs> you left the keys in the ignition <laughs> and parked it outside a saloon. Why didn't you put a sign in the window, steal me? <laughs> The phone call was from John O. He was an older man who lived in Hoboken, but he had a summer place up here. And he was going to be playing poker that night with a bunch of his cronies at his house, but his car had broken down. He wondered if I would uh, deliver half a dozen bottles of whiskey to him. Well, in those days, it was against the law to deliver whiskey if you were a business like this. But uh, we were desperate. We needed the money. So my wife took over the bar for a little while, and I went on the whiskey run out to Jano's. Well, it was a good thing I made the run and not my wife. And Jano's house was just disgusting. There were bags of garbage piled up and steaming in the summer heat. And Jano was uh, drunk, really drunk, and he was propped up against the couch. And uh, he was, uh, well, he reeked and he retched and he rambled and, and he cried. And I told me about his wife and his daughter, said he wanted to commit suicide. He called for a priest and, uh, and then he started waving a pistol around. John. I got a couple of numbers from him and uh, I called his wife in and, and Hoboken. Went, that sleazy bastard. I hope he does kill himself. I mean, he gets on, he's crying. These, these, these jags of his, he's drunk for weeks on end. Hey, my name is on that property deed up there. You got my permission. Dig a hole in the backyard and shove that son of a bitch in. I don't care if he's alive or dead. And put lots of dirt on him to make sure. I called his daughter. She was also in Hoboken. Well, my father, hey, I want you to get this straight, mister. Don't you never call me by my father again. You got that? You got that? You want me to tell you some of the stuff he's done? I'll tell you. Jeez. I retreated, headed back to the Empire, and I, I was wondering what kind of a place is Hoboken? Certainly not like Idilla Gilbert's, though. Jeez. <laughs> Gilbertsville. Car, car thieves are right here, downtown, downtown Gilbertsville. Next thing we'll have murderers. Murderers coming to Gilbertsville. <laughs> murderers, is it, Eric? <laughs> murderers. You know, someday they'll develop a pill which will increase intelligence. And some people were going to have to force feed. <laughs> Empire Hotel. Oh, Father, Father, boy, am I glad that you called. Woo, it's the parish priest from Morris. <laughs> father, Father, I, I've got a customer. He's an older guy. He's suicidal. He, he, he's calling for a priest. He's desperate. He's drinking. His wife, I, I mean, it's just, it's terrible. He needs a priest. Oh, it does sound really, really very bad. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, Father, he really does need a priest. He's pretty desperate. Oh, yes, they get this way when the booze is such a problem. <laughs> Father's wife and his daughter, they've abandoned him. Yes, it's very often the case. Father, he's got a, you know, he's talking suicide and he's, he's got a gun. Oh, that would make it much more complicated for you, I'm sure. <laughs> 
father, he wants to say his last confession, you know, before he pulls the trigger. <laughs> confession, yes, from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock every Saturday night, <laughs> just before the 8 o'clock mass. I called St. Mary's in Oneana, spoke to the secretary, but she said they probably couldn't help because we're outside the jurisdiction and they're down a, <laughs> they're down a priest for the summer, but she'd mention it to them. I called the state police. But he's got a frigging gun, for Christ's sake. They would do nothing until and unless he committed a crime or caused a disturbance. This guy was trying to, was trying to kill himself. I couldn't find anybody who would help him. You know who would help these saps? The monks. Yeah. <laughs> they would. I mean, the first thing they would do is get him off that friggin' whiskey. Yeah. I mean, that frisk, you know, whiskey and violence. They go, they go hand in hand, like you know. Meatballs and sandwiches. I mean, you know. I mean, you just think about this. Al Capone and, and Legs Diamond, I mean, they wasn't shooting each other up over truckloads of Cabernet Sauvignon, you know. <laughs> it was over the whiskey. That's what makes people violent. I mean, look at me. I'm a walking example. You know, when that woman, she give me, done me the dirty, well, I mean, I could have got violent. Did I get violent? No. I just drank some more cucamonga. I got mellow. Uh, I'll tell you, that's what they need. A little help from the monks. Oh, I can see it now. The monks would just fill up old John over the latest vintage. <laughs> big help, big help. Funny thing about Christians. They, uh, they love to pray down on their knees, in the safety of their churches, but out in the real world, the sordid world, not too many. A few, a few good Samaritans, but not many. That prayer is overrated. Prepare, prayer. I bet I could use a couple, couple of prayers for... My stolen car, my green beetle. Ah, yes, yes. Are you planning to, to lead a prayer session here at the Empire, Eric? No. No, it's my wife's department. She prays. I garden. <laughs> I've got a, a rototiller. She, she's got a, one of those rosemary thing of a pop there. A rosemary. A rosary. <laughs> Pacifier for the peasant. <laughs> very modern. Very modern, I think. I think they came in in the second century. Drove back out to check on Jono. If anything, he was worse. New fresh supply of, of whiskey, I suppose. And uh, I came back to the Empire, was greeted at the taproom door. Remember emergency, emergency, men's room, men's room? There emerged from the men's room a young priest. <laughs> oh, excuse. <laughs> Not to worry. Nah, the dead bird never flies the nest. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, you must be Thomas, the proprietor. <laughs> Patrick O'Donnell from County Cork in Ireland. <laughs> Happy to make your acquaintance. You've heard of the place, no doubt. <laughs> well, I'm over here in the St. Mary's for the summer, filling in for some of the lads so they can have a bit of a holiday like. 
And, uh, you know, the secretary said, well, here's an opportunity to go out to a pub. I don't get those opportunities very often. <laughs> so I understand you've got a chappy here who uh, wants to use his head to depart us with a bang, eh? Mm, well, uh, best give me his name and address, and I'll, uh, I'll just give uh, the AA a tinkle. They love to keep up on these things. And uh, When I make the phone call, do you mind drawing me a, a Guinness? <laughs> well, I knew you wouldn't have that, but any beer will do, thank you. The father, father, prayer. No, no, he put prayers for st stolen car. Green, green beetle. And went, gone, stolen, poop, poop, gone, just like that. Mm -hmm. you, you got these uh, patron, patron saint. Yeah, you're like the little pl plastic guy. <laughs> With the magnet, they stick him to the, to the dashboard. <laughs> ah, to be St. Joseph now, hey. St. Joseph, well, he... He helps you find your way when, you, when you're a bit lost, you know. Could, could have used him last night. <laughs> I was a bit foggy. I walked by my house twice. <laughs> <laughs> Father, you should have seen the cards I got straight, straight from heaven last night. You know, as you think of it, I think the same for you as St. Anthony. St. Anthony, yeah. He helps you find things. She's saying, Anthony, I'll, I'll call, call my wife. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's got a, a rose, rosemary and uh, I, I've got a rototilla. <laughs> Do you now? Patron saint. Guardian angel. Oh, now I have another Coke, please. I prefer that the ice cubes be made with holy water. <laughs> when John O. saw the priest, he lay his gun on the floor and he wept. And he told the priest he'd, he had been a, an altar boy as a, in the Bronx, Ectum Spiritutu Old, and Dominus Vobiscum, and, and all that. And he, uh, he went on and on about his wife and his, his daughter and his career, and uh, he talked about suicide. And then finally he asked the priest if he might listen to his confession. Uh, I'm going to leave, give you guys some privacy. A uh, father... Stop back at the Empire on your way home. I'll buy you another drink, eh? <laughs> As I opened the door, three men bolted in, muscled me aside. And they were led by Herb? What the hell are you doing here? He ignored me. Jeanno. <laughs> My name is Herb. Alex, Frank, we're from Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> You've heard of AA, I suppose. <laughs> I thought you would have. <laughs> Herb, Alcoholics Anonymous? Jano, Jano, you admit you're an alcoholic, don't you? Mm. Ah. Don't give us this rubbish about your wife and your daughter. We all have our crosses to bear. You know you're an alcoholic, don't you? Hmm. Have you hit bottom yet? Morgie, Morgie, I got to tell you. That Philomena, green grass, green grass, that's where it's at. <laughs> She's like an angel. Ah, uh, yes, uh, five Hail Marys, act of contrition, go in peace. Well, the priest did stop back at the empire on his, uh, on his way home to St. Mary's. Tom, you're doing a wonderful business here. Your, your parking lot's chock-a-block. I had to park way up on, on your back lawn, I did. I hope you don't, hope you don't mind. 
No, Father, <laughs> might cut down on the green grass and you never know. <laughs> green grass? Well, I've never heard of that. But if it's green, probably has something to do with Ireland. Hey? <laughs> Father, Father, was there, is there a Saint Philomena? You know, it's funny you should mention that. I studied her when I was in the seminary. Ah, as she was in Italy in the year 200, I think. She gave succor to the poor. Succor. Aye, aye. And you know the funny thing? The Mass, a couple of years ago, the, 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 the church had cut down on its list of saints. It had mothballed a bunch of saints. And for some reason, she was right at the top of the list. I understand, Father. Father, Father, father. I called, called my wife. She's she, she St. Anthony? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told her to do a couple of laps around the, the rosemary. Yeah. <laughs> you did now, the, the rosemary. Ah, the rosary. Ah, yes, yes, the Blessed Virgin. Ah, of course, of course. Well, you know, if that's the case, I have to report. I think, I think she's made contact. Oh, yeah, yeah. Out in the back lawn there, behind the big maple tree. Huh. There's a green beetle out there. Yeah. <laughs> a green, green beetle? <laughs> it's, it's a mi 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 miracle, a miracle. Hey, Thomas, Thomas, don't tell anybody, but uh, Philomena. Yeah, you remember I bought her a drink in the bar the other night? Well, one thing led to another. Next thing I know, we're, we're about to, in the back lawn there. And she said she wanted to try something she'd never tried before. It's called, it's called uh, green grass. Uh, Ah, yes, yes, five Hail Marys, good active condition. <laughs> While we're talking about miracles, I invite you to share one with me. As you may remember, when I was uh, uh, 21, I moved, emigrated to New Zealand, and I lived there for eight years. And there were a couple of enormous coincidences that got me to move to New Zealand, so enormous that I, I later regarded them not as a coincidence, but as, uh, as if there was some great power undefined, moving me to that country, my own impression. While I lived there, the years I was there, back here, unbeknown to me, my father was growing addicted to gambling and uh, betting everything and running the business, you know, over the, over the cliff. And uh, uh, he really started my uh, mother down a terrible path. At any rate... Um, we arrived back here uh, for a visit, and uh, we faced all, all of that, the suicide and the building and my mother's condition. And um, the point I'm trying to want to make with you, though, is that we arrived at the crucial moment. If we had arrived just a couple of days later because of insurance regulations, because of licensing and other restrictions, if we had arrived just a couple of days later, everything would have collapsed. And like Humpty Dumpty, there would have been no putting the pieces back together. So did I happen to arrive back here at just the crucial time by coincidence or by intervention? In the years I lived in New Zealand, I never imagined I would move my family to America. Not once. I had no reason to. No reason because I loved living in New Zealand. I loved working in New Zealand. I had a great job. I had great prospects. My wife and I had a beautiful home. Uh, we had uh, two uh, children under five years old. We had a third one on the way. Hardly the time to pull up stakes and move to another country. And I had no reason to live back here because I was not particularly close to my parents. Communication between us was very thin. And uh, besides, when I lived here before, my father and I argued incessantly. And uh, on top of that, living in New Zealand, I had not the slightest inkling that anything was amiss back at the empire. 
And yet, eight months before, my father killed himself. Eight months before. One night I was undressing for bed and I turned to my wife and I said, I don't know where the words came from. I think, I think we're supposed to move to America. Years later, she told me she never questioned that, never challenged it, because she had never seen a look on my face like the look she saw that night, as if I was in a trance. Well, the big move took a lot of months. We had to prepare the house for sale. We had to sell it in the down market. We had to sell off all of our furnishings. We had to pack up our belongings. We had to farewell our friends and farewell her relatives. And for what? We had not the slightest plan for doing anything back in America. Nothing. So what was going on? Was there some power moving us here to arrive at the crucial moment to, to rescue and protect my mother and my brother and the business? I think, I think there was. And I think it was the same power that had moved me to New Zealand in the first place. The rescue took a couple of years. And a couple of years after that, I decided to get back into my writing. I had been a writer in New Zealand, and I had to give it up when we tackled the problems of the empire. My first big project was to write a novel. And it was about a little boy in Bay City, Michigan. Well, when I was a little boy, we lived in Bay City, Michigan. And I attended St. James School and church from the third grade to the eighth grade. Well, this little boy lived in Bay City, Michigan, and he attended St. James School and Church, and most of the novel was autobiographical. Uh, at any rate, it took many, many months to write this. And in the course of writing it, I had to conjure up images of that church, which I had not seen in 25 years. And... Uh, so I, I pictured the church and the school, and the church and the students, and the church and the nuns, and the church and, and the pageantry, all of which went on in the church. I must have pictured that church a thousand times. And uh, I worked up an appetite. I, uh, by the time I finished that novel, I just felt I wanted to see that church. And I began to look for excuses to get out there to see it. And... Uh, Finally, an opportunity arose. I had to go to a conference in Chicago for a week in the summertime, and my wife and I decided we would pack up the kids and we would drive to Chicago. They would have a little vacation. I would do the conferencing, and then we would drive up on the way back to New York. We would drive up into Michigan to Bay City, and I would get a chance to see my church. We arrived... After midnight, we miscalculated. We trundled the bags and bundled the kids into bed in the Holiday Inn. And then I slipped into a jacket, which caused my wife to do a double take. Where, where are you going? What, what are you doing? I, uh, I, I want to go for a walk. I, uh, well, you know, I, I want to see my church. Honey. It's after one in the morning. Yeah, I know. I know. I just, uh, I want to I see the church. <laughs> you know, you were a little boy when you lived here. You don't even know where it is. I know, I know. But I just want to see the church. It will be there in the morning, for God's sake. I know, I know. I just, I just, you just. You want to see your church. Guilty, I do. Well, I wandered the, the streets of Bay City. I didn't know any of them. I, I found the street, found the street. And I walked up and down, but I couldn't find the church. That's gone, probably. Oh, well. 
I was just about to turn back to head back to the Holiday Inn. There it was, kitty corner, dark, gloomy. I broke out into sweat. There are only two times in my life when the hair in the back of my head has stood up. One was in the middle of the Pacific. I was on my Navy ship. And we hit a typhoon, and it threatened to sink us, and then we got a fire in the ammunition hole. Ooh. And the second time was when I caught sight of that church. Ooh. I floated across the street. I made my way slowly up the steps of the church. And as if a big hand pushed me from the rear, I found myself pressed up against the wooden doors and my fingers digging into the stone. I was trying to embrace the church. Big church, too. Eventually, I edged my way around the corner and I made my way down the entire length of the church, never removing my hands from those stones as if I was afraid to lose contact after all of this time. If the cops had seen me, they would have dragged me in. All the way down. Finally, I was able to pull myself away to go around the rest of the St. James block, the, the convent and the, the gym and the schools and the rectory and then back to that church. And I, uh, I wanted to stay with that church all night. Great, great reluctance. I finally, I finally broke away and deserted her, turned my back. Went back to the Holiday Inn. In the morning, I got up and uh, found a phone book and found the name of a guy I was in school with Morgan, Morgan, is it really you? My God, ha, 20, 25 years. Well, what the hell are you doing in Bay City? Oh, we talked about the kids. We talked about the nuns. And then, you know, it's funny you should call me this morning of all time, yeah, all day. St. James, the church. I was hit by lightning last night and it burned down. Oh, my God. We arrived to find it in ruins. The roof had burned off entirely. And there was rubble piled up on the pews and hoses snaked up and down the aisles, the aisles where I had genuflected as a little boy. Oh, my God. There were a couple of priests standing in the rubble and they were gawking at the sky through where the, the roof had been. Pilate. Father, I, I was here last night. I mean, just before this, this happened. I, I came all the way from upstate New York. We drove, you know, way out of our way. I was I compulsion to come and, and, and see this church. Binghamton? You're anywhere near Binghamton, New York? <laughs> Father McPhee from Binghamton without a P. <laughs> That's how he used to introduce himself. Father, this is, uh, this is more than a coincidence. I mean, this is bizarre. I, I, I wonder if you can help. Yep. Father McPhee from Binghamton without a P. I knew him in the seminary. He had a, he has a great way to introduce himself. <laughs> oh, God. I wanted to throttle him around his Roman collar. I wanted to get in his face. Say, hey. I, I don't know what I believe these days, but you're in the God business. Can you explain this? I mean, in this entire planet, there are billions of people and probably only one person on this entire planet has written a novel about this church. And he feels compelled to come visit and he travels hundreds of miles to be here last night. And he presses himself up against the doors of this church. And an hour later, that goddamn church is destroyed. Can you explain this? 
Can you tell me what the hell is going on? What is going on here? Well, they knocked the stone walls down, never used the church again. You know, it matters little what I may happen to believe or not believe about God. I've always considered it way above my cerebral pay grade to even try to comprehend questions like that. But you, do you have any friends who doubt that there are strange, invisible, undefined powers at work in this world? If you know anybody who says, miracles, nah, they never happen, send them to me. I'll tell them this story. And then I'll probably tell them what Joe Palatano would have told me. Hey, what's the matter for you? After something like this, after something like this, I can't understand. Well, you don't got no faith. You got to have a little faith. Have faith, my children. We are now going to call a recess, otherwise known as an intermission. Go. The first act is ended. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back. You remember in the first act, we reminisced about Jack Benny and his TV show. Some of you might remember another TV show from that era. I remember Mama. It was about an immigrant family. It had a young woman as a narrator. And in the introduction each week, we'd see her flipping through the album of family photos. And she would say, I remember my cousins, my brothers, my sisters, Papa. But most of all, I remember Mama. Deep in December, it's nice to remember, although we know the snow will follow. <laughs> Deep in December, it's nice to remember. Without a hurt, the heart is hollow. Well, our hearts suffered their share of hurts. They did. From our years at the Empire, I remember my mama, my mother, and she could not remember. My father had uh, run the business uh, over a cliff and had started the family and uh, business down a, a spiral and uh, then he killed himself and that sucked my wife and I into that spiral and alongside my mother who was slip sliding into Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. I remember she faded like a photo aging till I could scarcely recognize her. I remember how she groped desperately for shards of substance within that fog of confusion, the porridge her mind had become. Speaking with her was akin to speaking with an apparition, an apparition that took on flesh and was real for brief periods and then slipped out of focus and dissolved. She, she clung to bits and pieces from our conversations and her grip was so tight that, that she would bring them up a dozen times in a week only to forget we'd had the conversation to begin with. And I remember her preparing her last big family dinner at Christmas at the Empire. I remember Herky. Herky, the poet laureate. I called him our poet laureate because he, he loved to spout poetry in the tap room. He told me he threatened my father with a shotgun for sleeping with his wife. <laughs> Little did he know <laughs> later. Herky also loved to puncture egos in the tap room, any ego that dare inflate itself. <laughs> I remember my sisters, one of whom I never knew existed, and one who I knew existed, but I never knew had lived. I remember, I do. The story of my mother's last big family dinner begins 
couple of weeks before Christmas with, with Jack Sherburn. Jack and Buffy uh, lived in a mansion that looked down upon the village and looked down upon, it's a good way to describe it, uh, because they were from old money, money of boarding schools and vast lawns and big pools and lots of staff and drivers and stuff like that. And I think they looked upon the villagers the way that owners of thoroughbred horses might look upon owners of hacks. <laughs> now, Jack was wealthy, but Jack was cheap. My mother told me that for his daughter's wedding, cheap champagne <laughs> in plastic glass, <laughs> Jubilee. <laughs> so uh, Jack was rich and Jack was cheap and Jack had full use of his appendages, but Jack was suspended by string held by Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> and he feared her wrath, and we did too for good reason. For Jack and Buffy had money, a lot of it. And Jack and Buffy drank, a lot. And Jack and Buffy had guests, a lot of them. And Jack and Buffy's guests drank, a lot. And we sold them the booze, a lot. And we needed the money. We were desperate. Hmm. Well, one wintry morning, Jack ventured out across the ice on the streets of Gilbertsville a couple of weeks before Christmas. And he uh, made his way to the Empire Hotel, to the liquor store. And 10 minutes after he had visited us, he was back. Oh dear, I slept on the ice, when I broke the bottles of whiskey. Oh, Jack, you, okay, you didn't cut yourself. Break, break anything? You want to ride home? No, no, but Buffy, I mean, I have to, I have to buy two more bottles of scotch. No problem, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> We got plenty of scotch, but see Christmas time. Johnny Walker, red, yeah. Well, the price hasn't gone up in the last 10 minutes, Jack. So it would be the same, you know, 37. Oh, I bet I shouldn't have to pay. <laughs> I never got the bottles home. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you, uh, you must have slipped on our sidewalk? No. On our on a parking lot. I was supposed to put down some sand. No. No, I slipped in front of the grocery store in the street. Oh, dear. Well, that's the case, Jack. I'm going to have to, you know, charge you for... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. What will I tell Buffy? <laughs> well, tell her what happened. I'm sure she'll understand. Oh, no. You don't know Buffy. You don't know the half. Could I maybe, uh, you know, pay for it over several months, a little bit at a time? Or, <laughs> or could I get a discount? Uh, Jack, uh, you know what kind of condition we're in around here. We can hardly afford to give a discount or a time payment. Oh, dear. What will I tell Buffy? What will I tell Buffy? <laughs> and now the story of my mother's uh, preparing her last big uh, dinner, Christmas time. In the years my parents owned the Empire Hotel, my father opened for business every single day of the year. Even Christmas Day, he opened till about 2 in the afternoon, serving up Tom and Jerry's. The only hours in the entire year that he would close would be the afternoon and evening hours of Christmas Day itself. Well, with him warm in his grave, we thought we'd continue the uh, tradition, not as a tribute to him, but because of him. We were desperate all together now. We needed the money. <laughs> We were desperate in other ways. 
We had been there for five months, my wife and I, and we were weary like beaten dogs. Weary of tending to drunks at three in the morning and tending to three kids under five uh, while trying to run a business. And weary of coping with and caring for my mother and weary of looking after and sometimes looking for my younger brother. <laughs> weary of fending off creditors and toting up bills that we couldn't hope to pay. We were living in a nightmare. My mother has announced that she will prepare the big Christmas dinner all by herself, thank you. No help wanted. This would be her triumph. She will show us that she still retains her faculties. In her world about the kitchen, it's, uh, it's very sad. She uh, Shushes my wife. She brushes aside my aunt's offers of help. She, uh, she snaps at me and orders me to shoo the drinkers out of the tap room and close it up so that uh, she, can, uh, she can serve and, and we can eat. Not fair. Sit down, children. Sit down. Everybody, sit, sit down. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is my gift to all of you. Yes, for Christmas. She is uh, discombobulated. Her thoughts are as disorganized as her hair, which she has forgot to tame that morning. And she is, uh, well, she's done odd things. She's uh, in this world about the kitchen. She, she uh, forgot that she'd mashed potatoes, and she mashes more. And she uh, leaves the stuffing for the turkey up at one end of the big commercial stove. And, uh, and she inserts the, the turkey empty in a stove that's unlit. Only my wife's alertness rescues the turkey and rescues the pies because she notices the sugar that was supposed to go into the mixes. So at any rate, she finally gets us all settled down here. And... and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, dear. If that's your brother, ask him to call back. Tell him we're just sitting down to dinner. He'll, he'll understand. Merry Christmas, Empire Hotel. Oh, I'm so happy that you're still there. Oh. I forgot to buy the wine, silly me. I'll be right down. Uh, no, sir, sir, no. No, we're closed. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we're, we're closed. We're just sitting down to dinner. But it's only a hop, skip, and a jump. I'll be right down there. Just, I just want to collar a couple of bottles of wine. Sir, we are, we are closed. It's uh, our only day off, and we're just sitting down to dinner. I'm sorry. But man, you're already there. <laughs> I know, sir. I, I, you may not understand, but we're, we're closed. I'm sorry. You did the right thing. Be firm like that. Your father would have been firm like that. Now, carve the turkey just, just as your father would have done. Thank you. Mm. Ah. If that's your brother. Empire Hotel, man. This is Buffy Sherba. There must be some mistake. Yes, I just had my brother-in-law call down for some wine, and he said that you won't open for us. I mean, can, it can't be. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Sherburn. Uh, we are closed. We're just sitting down to dinner. The whole family is gathered, and 
it's our only day off. It's only a half a day off. My mother's gone through a lot of troubles, and, and she's having her, her problems. Well, I'm so happy for all your family. Yes, wish them a happy Christmas for me. But I'm sure I don't have to remind you that we do a lot of business with you in the course of the year. We only shop locally to support you local merchants. And, um, I, you know, for that reason alone, I would expect that you would open for us. Especially, you know, especially after you treated Jack the way I treated Jack. You know, when he fell on your ice on your sidewalk and broke the whiskey bottle. I told him he should never have paid for another two bottles. But that's Jack. He's, you know, so generous. But uh, we'll mark it down as a little Christmas gift, shall we? From us to you. You know, if, uh, if he'd broken anything, we would have, uh, our lawyers uh, would have uh, uh, wanted us to sue you. But anyway, my brother-in-law, assuming I knew that you would open for us, so I sent him back down there, and he should be at your doorstep this very moment. Oh, Mrs. Sherburn, I... Uh, hello. Hello. Merry Christmas. God. If that phone rings again, don't answer it. Don't answer it. Now carve the turkey. I mean, the dinner is beginning to get cold. The children are getting restless. It's, uh, no. <laughs> Who on earth could that be? It must be the kids or something. Good Lord. Good Lord. Well, where, where are you going? Hey, what are you doing? Your father would never have done this. What do you mean? It's because of your father that you have. I have no idea what you're talking about. Chestnuts roasting on an open I love Christmas, don't you? <laughs> Thank you for opening up, old boy. It's beautiful. I must explore your assortment here to see just what you have on offer here. A third uh, family is uh, sitting down for dinner. Oh, don't fret, don't fret. I'll only be a second. First night of Christmas. Oh, you really don't have much of a selection now, do you? <laughs> well, that's the price one pays when one chooses to live in a village. You're the expert. Which one of these would you say goes with confit of duck? Uh, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't know, sir. Uh, I've never had confit of duck. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You haven't. <laughs> you haven't lived, man. Ooh. Well. Have to be one of these, I suppose. You don't happen to have it chilled, do you? You do. Ah, in the refrigerator. I never saw that refrigerator. Whoo! Look at all the wines in there. I better explore those. <sighs> sir, sir, it's uh, my family. We're all at the dinner table. You joined the club, old boy. <laughs> we were just about to sit down when Buffy said, you forgot the wine. Ooh, Buffy. <laughs> Mustn't offend Buffy. You know that as well as I do. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, dear. In the rush, I forgot to bring my wallet. Oh. Never fear. I'll be back in the morning to... No, I won't. No, we're going traveling. I'll be back in about three weeks to pay for this. Where? Where have you been? My God, where? I mean, the dinner is ruined. It's ruined. I'm, 
and the turkey's cold, the potatoes are like sludge, the, the gravy is congealed. God, after all my work, I can't, I can't bear to eat here. I'll go do the dishes. That's all I'm good for anymore, is doing dishes. I remember Mama. And I remember Herky and the way he punctured those egos in the tap room. And I remember the night that he lured Conrad into a little trap. He lay out crumbs. And Conrad went for them. Conrad was a topper. He had to top everything. No matter what the claim was, the brag, uh, the, you know, the, the, the boast, Conrad had done it better. Bah. You want 200 bucks in a lottery? Chicken feet. Chicken feet. A couple of years ago, I won 10,000 bucks in that lottery. Wow, the snow's up to your knees. Hmm. You should have been with me in the blizzard of 48. Jeez, them snow drifts, it was up to the roof. There was. What's that, Herky? What? Your old man, he got to see the first Dempsey Tunney fight, yeah? In Yankee Stadium. Yeah, well, that was a good fight. Yeah, yeah. I went to it. I seen the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the big fight, I mean the best fight of the whole century was the rematch. When those two guys got back together, yeah. The second Dempsey Tunney fight. Yeah, that was Yankee Stadium. I seen that too, man. That was that was a fab say you should have. The old man should have been to see that one. Is that right? Is that right, Conrad? You got to see the second Dempsey Tunney fight. Oh. I just, this was the fight that had the long count. Was this the same fight? Yeah, yeah, I had the real long fight. You know, the count, I mean, the referee went on and on. I think he counted to 30, for Christ's sake. I thought that mob was going to rip him apart. They probably should have, you know. Jeez, that was, I mean, he just, he robbed him. He robbed him. Yes, yes, that's what all the reports said. Yeah. Conrad, tell me. Tell me, Yankee Stadium. Tell me, what was, I've never been in Yankee Stadium. I've never met anybody who saw this Right. What was Yankee Stadium like? You know, was it uh, crowded? Was it crowded? Well, of course it was crowded. Jeez, we just packed in there like sardines, for Christ's sake. Yankee Stadium. I loved that place. I was just a kid. And they snuck me in. You know, a pal of mine worked there. Ah, Ten rows... From ringside, we've seen the whole thing. Yeah, 10 rows from ringside. Tell me, tell me, Conrad, what was it like? Oh, was it quiet or was it noisy? Hmm? Quiet? What the hell do you mean quiet? Jeez, the place was exploding, for Christ's sake. Must have been 60,000 people in that place. Well, the reason I asked, Conrad, is that, you know, on that night, when you were 10 rows from ringside at Yankee Stadium, can we have the almanac, Mr. Barkeep? Yeah. I know I don't want to give it to Conrad. Yeah. See, on that night, Conrad, when you were 10 rows from ringside, they were having the fight in Chicago. Herky, 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 he told me once that he had threatened my father with a shotgun for sleeping with his wife. What he didn't tell me, because he didn't know, 
what others told me because they knew was that my father was also sleeping with his girlfriend, Sal. <laughs> Busy little hamlet we have here. Welcome to dinner theater in Gomorraville. <laughs> at any rate, um, I was angry at that point, angry with my father for everything that he had dumped on us. And I was so frustrated. And um, uh, in that anger, I was, I was trying to put pieces together of the puzzle of my father's last few years before he killed himself. And one of the pieces stuck in my craw. And so to resolve that, I went to visit that girlfriend, Sal. I had known Sal before I went to New Zealand. I knew her and her ex-husband, Jimmy. They were good friends of my parents. So we reminisced about old times before I went away, and I brought her up to date on New Zealand. And then I figured I'd better get down to what I had come to see her about. I uh, Sal, um, I don't want to embarrass you, but um, a lot of people who no, have told me my father uh, he used to sleep with you. They did. They did. <laughs> well, people will say anything. It's not true. It's not true. Sal, they also tell me that your daughter, my father is the father of your daughter. Oh, they did. Oh, well, he's not. Jimmy, of course. Jimmy's the father. Sal, so, uh, you and I know that by then, you and Jimmy were separated for a couple of years. Jimmy was living in Cincinnati, and it wasn't Herky, because Herky shoots blanks. He brags about it in the, in the tap room. <laughs> Herky? What's Herky got to do? Well, no. You know, Jimmy would come back to Gilbertsville now and again, and he'd visit me sometimes. Sal, can I uh, meet your daughter? No, no, no. She's at her, her grandmother's all month, all month. And there's no reason to bring her into it, no. A photo, can I see a photo of her? This makes me very uncomfortable. I really think you should leave. Your father and I were good friends. I remember 20 years later, the newspaper, the daughter had been killed in a car accident. I remember the photo. I thought I was looking at a photo of my own daughter. The two women could have been twins. I remember my sister. I remember another sister, Mary Michelle. Mary Michelle was 55 years old. Mary Michelle was 18 months old. The year was 1948. We were living in Syracuse. My parents were young and handsome and popular, and they were, uh, my father was, was uh, uh, moving upward in the business world, which was expanding after the war. They, uh, they loved to show off their two strapping sons, Patrick Seven and Tom Six. <laughs> they were buying their first house. They were uh, dancing at supper clubs. They were playing bridge. My father was growing a garden. He was buffing up his Packard automobile. They were very prominent at 10 o'clock mass at St. John the Baptist every Sunday morning. And then there struck an almighty blow. When Mary Michelle was born, people whispered, retarded, if they said anything at all. My parents said very little. My mother, in effect, hoisted it upon her back like a cross. She told me years later that 
Mary and Michelle's arrival had absolutely devastated her life, and no one could ever, ever imagine what it must have been like. My father kept his silence. His was a life of small triumphs and large failures. And to father, a mentally retarded daughter was, to his mind, an immense failure. As she grew but remained an infant, she denied them the pleasures that parents expect. There was no happy announcement of her first words or her first steps. There was no passing around of baby photos, no bragging about her progress. When she finally learned to walk, it was awkwardly. When she learned to speak, she was able to put together only a handful of words in her vocabulary and never more than two or three words at one time. You have known Down syndrome children and adults who are content and they're happy. Now Mary Michelle, she was pissed off, <laughs> angry, angry. Now, that added to my mother's gloom. My parents did not become recluses, but her birth certainly cut back on their social life, put a crimp in it. It was very difficult to find babysitters for mentally retarded kids. And to take her out in public, well, people averted their, their eyes and, and they mumbled behind their hands and they, they shushed their children and told them not to stare. Well, she was worth staring at if you were a kid because her hair grew out like she was a monkey and her nose ran all the time and her saliva dribbled over her chin and her skin became scorched as if it had been blowtorched. I remember my grandmother, my mother's mother, cradling her because my grandmother loved every creature that ever came into her orb and we have photos of her gazing upon the baby that she's, or the little girl she's, she's cradling as if she's the most precious gift alive. And I think to my grandmother, she was. My mother did not do a lot of cradling. And once Mary was beyond infancy, I don't remember that she really held her much at all. I do remember, I do remember that my parents never explained to me anything about my sister's condition, not one. No, that fell to a babysitter. We were in Bay City, Michigan by then. I was 11 years old. She happened to say something about mental retardation, and I asked what that had to do with anything, and she sat me down and had the talk that my parents should have had with me. Not long after that, my father took a job that took him away from us every week, every week. He was only home on weekends and not every weekend and not for the entire weekend. I felt he had detached himself from us in ways big and small. I felt, I felt he had deserted us. To this day, his frenetic travel, to me, represented his desire to escape us, to escape the failure that was Mary Michelle. When I was in high school, they moved us back to upstate New York. They bought a little grocery store. And then they bought the Empire Hotel. And along the way, they made a deposit at a warehouse. They deposited an eight-year-old girl in a huge institution in Rome, New York, put her into the hands of the uh, state of New York. My mother wept many times. My father remained stoic. The first Christmas, my mother brought her home. And uh, I think she was visiting her maybe once a month. Brought her home for Christmas, and we could see that she now could say yes instead of yeah. And um, no longer was her skin inflamed because, uh, you know, when she was a little girl, we didn't dare take her out anywhere because people would avert their eyes and they would, they, they would mumble behind their hands and they would shush their children tell them not to look at her because her hair flared out like a monkey's and her nose dribbled all the time and the saliva ran down her chin and inflamed her skin. Well, there she was coming home for Christmas and she no longer had that inflamed skin and that was a big difference. After that, my mother, well, her visits grew a little more sporadic and it wasn't very long before Mary Michelle no longer recognized my mother. 
her mother. Many years later, when I returned from New Zealand to the empire, I learned that my mother had no interest in Mary Michelle or in any news of her. She had not seen her for years. I went to see her a couple of times, but it confused her. She had no idea who I was after all of those years, and that she grew angry and I think frightened. She moved away from me. It fell to me to become her legal guardian, and so the bureaucrats began to send me the reams of plans and uh, goals and training programs and, and all the things they were doing with Mary for the 500th time they were trying to teach her to brush her teeth and to dress herself. And uh, I grew so frustrated with it because at that time I had a nephew who was three years old and he was semi-autistic and he desperately needed help from the state and he wasn't getting any. And here was my sister. He had great potential and she had no potential. She was a baby. And she was lavished with services. And I thought, ah, oh, just feed her and clothe her and keep her safe and give her toys. I mean, her life has no meaning for anyone. Well, a couple of people had jobs because of her, and I suppose that counted for something. But uh, after a while, I stopped wading through those, those reams because uh, nothing ever changed. It was all just make work gobbledygook as far as I was concerned. Over the years, the state closed down the big facility in Rome, and they moved all the residents out to uh, community homes. And they moved Mary out to a home, and she lived there for about three years. Then they moved her to another, which was about an hour and a half from the empire. Her caregivers would call now and again if there was any issue, and um, they would send out cheery invites to Christmas and birthday parties, but I protested. Uh, I ignored them. I mean, I... I uh, you know, why pretend that my visit would mean anything to her or to me? I mean, they were paid to keep up the pretense, but I didn't have to. Well, they began to call with reports that her health was deteriorating, and then the call came that Mary Michelle had died. Would I come to the funeral? Yes. Should they bury her there? Sure, yeah, why not? The day of the funeral was cold, wet, gray. I wondered if I would be the only mourner at the funeral. <laughs> Nobody else from the family would be there, I know that. A, there were 40, 50 people in the chapel before her open casket. Any excuse for a day off, I suppose. But some of them were weeping. They were blotting their tears. And they began to introduce themselves to me. I was with Mary it's in Rome. It was years ago. But I never forgot her. She was unforgettable. She was with us for three years. And we hated to see her go. She was... She was really grand. She was a fine lady. A fine lady. We loved her. Wonderful woman. Wonderful woman. We're so sorry to see her go. I studied my sister in the casket. Mary Michelle, a lady, a woman. I only knew her as a, as a little girl. I see an infant. She had the gray hair, creases, uh, you know, wrinkles creasing her face. And her nose looked look like her mother's, my mother's, and her chin looked like her aunt's. And, oh, she's was protruding. I remember how stubborn she was as, as a kid. <laughs> Those eyebrows, they look, uh, they look like mine. <laughs> well, she resembled in small ways Mary Michelle as a little girl, but 
much, much more she looked like uh, the other adults in the family, the, the other adults. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside still waters. He was a kindly minister, simple service, simple eulogy. He was followed by a young caregiver who wept her way through a poem she had written just for Mary for that funeral. Followed by another caregiver who did pretty much the same thing. And then an older woman, a retarded woman who had palsy, stood and cried out to speak. And the minister went to her and he took her by the hand. Come on, yeah, yeah, it's okay, come on, come on. And he led her up to Mary Michelle's casket. She slipped her fingers through Mary's hair. Mary, Mary. Another caregiver spoke about Mary's sense of humor. She had a raucous voice, a raucous laugh, and she loved country and western music and would sing along with it. She inspired us. We loved her. And the final tribute came in the simplest of forms, another retarded woman. I love you, Mary. I love you. I love you. The minister asked if, if I would like to say a few words. Oh, sure. Piece of cake. I'm pretty good at speaking off the cuff. Yeah. I wanted the caregivers to know something about Mary Michelle before the years when they knew her, when she was a little girl. And uh, so I began to talk about her as a little girl. And as I spoke, my words were, were suddenly drowned out by sobs. Not theirs. Mine. Sobs that had begun to well, I suppose, when I was but a lad. A boy who asked why my sister was so different and got no answers. Sobs prisoned these many decades until finally released by the gentle tributes of these lovely people. Sobs given life by a death. Sobs to accompany the words that I never, never expected to speak. But speak them I finally did. I want, I want you to know Mary Michelle's parents were ashamed of her. They were Ashamed. They hid her from view as much as they could. My brother and I had the job of whisking her away upstairs and out of sight and out of sound whenever anybody came near the house. It was, it was a different world. I mean, there were no sheltered workshops and training programs. There were no community homes. And I mean, to so many people, so many people. The Mary Michelles of this world were, were that they were subhuman. My mother and father were crushed. They were crushed by the shame of having given her birth. And they were, I mean, they were just not equipped to look after her emotionally. And they bought a little grocery store and, and, and they, they couldn't look after, and they wouldn't. They didn't take the time. And then they bought a saloon. And, uh, you know, it would never have been good for the likes of Mary and Michelle. So I think given the times, given their attitudes, given the attitudes of people around them, depositing Mary and Michelle in that warehouse, well, that was probably the best thing that could have happened to Mary and Michelle. When Mary Michelle was 22, her father killed himself. Her mother tumbled into a, an Alzheimer's so deep that within a few years she knew less than her daughter knew. And her younger brother, he died young from cancer. So you see, there weren't many young people uh, in the family to look after Mary Michelle. 
You, you were her family. You were her family. I failed. I failed. I mean, I didn't, I didn't come to see her. I told myself that it would just confuse her and throw her out of her routine. Or maybe I was selfish. Maybe I was selfish. I thank you. I thank you for giving her a family. You, you are the angels. You are the angels of our times. We adjourn to Mary Michelle's home, the home of a dozen Mary Michelle's and their caregivers. And she was there, staring out at us from a huge poster in the kitchen, just smiling. <laughs> I could see that one eye turned in, and I'd totally forgotten that. And her teeth splayed, and I'd forgotten that, too. Well, you know, there was no corrective surgery and no teeth braces for kids like Mary Michelle, for men and women like Mary Michelle. I could see from the photos on the walls of the kitchen that Mary Michelle had grown gaunt and her illness, and her hair flared out, as it had when she was a kid, as it did in the few photos of her as a little girl that my mother left behind. We sat in a big circle in the living room. I sat on the couch, and the caregivers reminisced about Mary Michelle, and they talked about uh, the fact that uh, she would sing all the lyrics of her favorite country and western song. She was never able to put together more than two or three words at the very most when she spoke, but she could sing all the lyrics of any number of favorite country and western songs. And they said she kept them in stitches because she would uh, feign anger and put on a gruff look. And her voice would get gruff and, and she would uh, paw at them, try to grab them and say, you want to fight? You want to fight? And I was able to advise them that she learned that little routine from her older brother, my older brother, Pat, 50 years ago. Talk about a memory. Hmm. Jerry uh, has the look of a lot of, we associate with a lot of Down syndrome uh, people, the extended jaw and the recessed forehead, sort of like Jay Leno with his head compressed a little bit. <laughs> Well, Jerry walked across the room. He sat down next to me on the couch, and he held my hand. I will miss Mary, Tom. I will miss Mary. I like Mary. Mary was nice. Mary, do you like food, Tom? I like food. <laughs> Mary liked cheeseburgers. Do you like cheeseburgers, Tom? Tom, Tom, Tom and Jerry, Tom and Jerry, you're the cat, and I'm the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I like Mary, Tom. Mary was nice. As he spoke, it came to me in a rush that Mary Michelle was the absolute agent of change. She had changed the very destinies of her parents and in turn her three brothers. I said goodbye to Jerry. Goodbye, Tom. Goodbye. Do you like cheeseburgers, Tom? <laughs> As I stood, the gray-haired woman with palsy slipped her fingers into mine. Who are you? I'm, uh, I'm Mary's brother. Who? She nestled her head against my chest. God bless. God bless you. I kissed her curls. He kissed me. <laughs> I made a round of farewells, and as I did, I was overcome with the thought that uh, these lovely people had given me more than a final glimpse of my sister. In many respects, they had given me a first glimpse. And in a short period of time, they had taught me that 
Mary Michelle was a real person. She wasn't an abandoned eight-year-old. She had a, a personality. She had a life. And she had a family that cared very deeply for her. Farewell. Farewell, you angels. The director led me out. And I told him I changed my mind that we would have Mary buried in Gilbertsville in the family plot in the cemetery about a quarter of a mile from the Empire Hotel. And after 48 years, that little girl would be reunited with her parents. He took me through her bedroom, and it was spartan and simple. And ironically, it reminded me of the bedroom of her aunt, my aunt, Sister Lawrence Joseph. That was the kind of bedroom she lived in in the convent all of her adult years. Before I left, he slipped a CD into my hands. We put together a bunch of Mary's favorite songs for you. I sat in the drive for a little while and I took in the view that uh, Mary had had from her bedroom window of the hills and the trees and the river and I slipped the CD into the player. And watching the river, I got a sense of time, the flow of time and how Mary's life had spanned such a flow from a time when villages and neighbors, neighborhoods had their Mary Michelles and they referred to them as village idiots and they treated them as such to a time now when at least in this corner of the world we've got the wisdom and the wealth to ensure that the Mary Michelles of this world are treated with dignity and respect and they're allowed to live in comfortable homes and they're given the love of surrogate families. Oh, the tears flowed and the music played. And you may not believe this, but the very first song of Mary's favorites, you ready for this? I don't know why they say grown men don't cry. Touche, Mary Michelle. Touche. <laughs> well, the time has come to say goodnight to this old Empire Hotel, downtown Gilbertsville, population 348, on a busy night. <laughs> and the time has come to say goodnight to you. Thank you.